Well, again, it's my honor and privilege to introduce our uh, guest speaker this morning. He's no stranger to us at Cornerstone. Chris uh, was with us a number of years ago when uh, Brent was doing a sabbatical, and, and it's uh, great to reconnect. And just a quick backstory on this. I got a call from our scheduled speaker uh, on Friday. said, I tested positive for COVID. I said, ooh, ooh. And so I went through the Rolodex in my mind. I thought, who can come? And we've got a number of very talented guys here and capable guys. And I thought, well, they're doing this and they're doing that. And in my back of my mind, I thought, Maybe I'll call. No, Chris is he. There's no way he's available. He's always doing something. He's got all this great stuff going on, but I just couldn't let it go. So I said, well, I'll just ping him, see what happens. And it was clearly the Lord's sovereign leading to have him with us this morning. A, a just a phenomenally encouraging message uh, for us. Chris is an accomplished attorney in town, but more importantly, he's a man that loves Jesus He's a man that uh, knows the word well, and he will uh, bless us this morning with uh, his insights from the book of John. Would you uh, give us a, a warm cornerstone welcome here to our speaker, Chris Martin. Fourth time I've had the opportunity to speak uh, to the congregation. It's good to see so many friendly faces. And I think I've got a lesson, or a, lesson, a uh, text that you're going to enjoy this morning. If you've got a Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 15, and our topic is earthly angels. And I'm going to have to do a little bit of a long introduction to let you know what we are talking about and we're not talking about because this is a really, really big deal. Uh, if we talk about angels, the first thing we think of are the heavenly angels. And that's not what we're discussing this morning. Another lesson for another Sunday morning. I may come back and do uh, uh, heavenly angels later, but today we're going to do earthly angels. And my first image of an earthly angel was Clarence. <laughs> now it's a Christmas classic, the 1946 Jimmy Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life, great movie, bad theology. Not what we're discussing earthly angels. As a young child, my next cinematic exposure to bad theology was Warren Beatty. Heaven can wait. Not only was he an earthly angel in Hollywood's mind, he was the quarterback of the Los Angeles Rams. It got worse in the 1980s. In the 1980s, my cinematic exposure was Richard Dreyfuss as an earthly angel in a movie called Always. And it got even worse in the 80s with uh, Christopher Lloyd in a horrible cinematic experience called Angels in the Outfield. The 80s got even worse with Nicolas Cage, Meg Ryan, and City of Angels. And the ultimate bad theology movie, John Travolta in Michael, the archangel, Drinking, smoking, carousing, not a great example of an angel. The theology got even worse in the 90s, into the 2000s with Legion and uh, Kenny Reeves and Constantine, proving once again after decades that Hollywood just doesn't get this issue of angels. So what am I talking about with an earthly angel? I'm not talking about the divine angels. I'm talking about an angelic equivalent here on earth. Who is it? It's me and you. It's normal people. The point today is you can be an earthly angel to someone. And when the inevitable bottom drops out of your world, in the days, months, or years to come, you're going to need an earthly angel to keep you alive, literally. So this morning's lesson is how others can be an earthly angel to you. What do you do to get an earthly angel in your life when life goes bad? And I mean real bad. And how are you capable of being equipped by God to be an earthly angel for someone else whose life tomorrow may literally depend on you being a messenger from God, an angel to them? Let me give you some context. This message by Jesus to disciples in John chapter 15 was given on the worst day of their lives. The 12 disciples, when this message is given, are dealing with severe debilitating depression, anxiety, literal fear for their lives, and a destitute despondency because everything they thought was reality is gone. See, these guys gave up everything to follow who they believed was going to be the very next King David. They gave up jobs, family, prestige, anything you could imagine, and they said, we're going to follow the guy who we think is going to be the next King of Israel, literally the King of the Jews. And this night, as Jesus washes their feet and serves them the Lord's Supper, they think all of that is gone. They thought that was delusional. 
because they know Jesus has a warrant out on his head and is likely going to be dead within 24 hours. They know as followers of him, as disciples of him, they're probably next. It was incredible fear, incredible anxiety, incredible depression, not knowing what tomorrow's going to bring. In other words, they're just like me and you. And that's the point of today's lesson. Now, John chapter 15 is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. Because to this audience of depressed, despondent, fearful men, Jesus gives them the guidelines for how to survive. He starts in John 15 chapter 1 and says, first thing we've got to talk about is your relationship with me the believer's relationship to Jesus. And he says, very, very simply, you've got to abide in me and I'll abide in you. In other words, you've got to stay close to me and I'll stay close to you. First 11 verses, actually first 15 verses cover that pretty good. In verses 12 through 17, he says, you guys got to get along with each other. I'll talk about that for our lesson this morning. And then he ends John chapter 15 by saying, now you've got to deal with the rest of the world because they're not going to like you. But in this little, little passage between abiding in him and a world hating us as believers, we get his command four times to agape one another. Unconditional, sacrificial love for one another. What does that mean? That's where I get this concept of an earthly angel. And what's critical is let's talk about the types of friendships because this is going to put our lesson into context. We've all got acquaintances. Acquaintances are those we just kind of know in passing. You recognize them. You see them in the neighborhood. There's a little funny social media app called Facebook. I've got like 5,000 acquaintances, right? There's a couple hundred people I know from high school or college. There's a couple hundred lawyers and judges. There's like 4,000 people. I have no clue who they are. They just showed up one day. They're not friends. They're not close friends. I don't know anything about them. They're just on this thing called social media. Acquaintances are not what we're talking about. We've all got friends. Friends are somebody you know their name. They know your name. You may not know everything about them, but if you see them, they may give you a hug. You consider them friends from school or church or just around town. Kids, mutual parent friends or grandparent friends. Friends are friends. That's not what we're talking about. For most of us, we've got a few close friends. These are the people that you want to go on vacation with. It's more than just a meal. It's more than knowing their name. You actually know what's going on in their lives a little bit more. You're the kind of people that they'll reach out to you. You reach out to them on a pretty regular basis. They're close. That's not even what I'm talking about this morning. You see how it's progressing from acquaintance to friend to close friend to go to earthly angel. It's even deeper than a close friend. It can be even deeper than a spouse, although in some circumstances your spouse can be your earthly angel. The earthly angel is that person that no matter what's going on is going to show up continually to help you in a time of crisis and that God can use you as an earthly angel to someone else in their time of crisis. Let me give you a definition. Before I give you though, I want to put this into context of why this is such a big deal. In the midst of crisis... Our sin nature triggers. Our divine nature longs for togetherness. The divine nature is that which we see in the Godhead, in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, permanently together, permanently enjoined, permanently in fellowship, permanently communicating, constantly communicating in fellowship. That's the divine model. Our sin nature is the exact opposite. And the exact opposite is when we're anxious, when we're depressed, when we're sad, when we're scared, When we're confused, our sin nature is climb in bed and pull the covers over our head. The exact opposite of the divine nature, which is social, interactive, intimate, sin nature is get in bed, pull the covers over our head. The reason that epitomizes our sin nature is when you're in bed alone with the covers pulled over your head or the functional equivalent, you are a sitting duck for Satan to pick off. You have no fellowship, no encouragement, no prayer, not the word of God. You're just by yourself, which is exactly where Satan wants you to be. So when you have this sin nature flare, your need for an earthly angel has never been higher. When the sin nature flares, your ability to be an earthly angel for someone else has never been greater. With that background, we live in the 21st century with all kinds of pretend intimate relationships. We pretend on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and on and on and on. And you may think you've got all these friends 
that are close to you and watch what's going on in your life. In reality, we've never been more alone. We've never been more distant. We've never had less close friends. We've never had fewer earthly angels. So the need and the reason I'm giving you this lesson is not only is this the reason I'm standing in front of you today because of what God's done in my life through earthly angels, but the challenge for you to be that for someone else who literally needs you to survive tomorrow. Unique danger to men. I mention this in passing because, guys, this lesson is for you. Women are genetically better capable of being an earthly angel because of the way God made them. They're more communicative. They're more talkative. They're more capable of sitting in pain. Guys, we fix problems, right? We work the process. We give advice. We do the stuff you got to do. We solve problems. And most guys, quite frankly, emotionally, are Neanderthals. I've been there. I lived decades as a Neanderthal, and I'm here to confess I've been a Neanderthal for a very, very long time in my adult life. The reason why is we want to do what an earthly angel is not supposed to do. We want to fix the problem. The person hurting doesn't need it to be fixed or preach theology or do anything else. They just need you to sit in the pain. And we're going to see some examples of this in John chapter 15 of how we're supposed to do this. But i got to mention for guys, this lesson is really for you because I think the biggest threat faced by most men today, when their wife leaves them, their children leave them, their job leaves them, their health leaves them, is they may have a million acquaintances, but they do not have an earthly angel in their lives. They don't have anybody that's going to cry with them. They don't have anybody that's going to say, hey, I know it's Friday night and you're by yourself. Let's go get a cup of coffee. I know it's Sunday night and you are depressed and not knowing how you're going to get up and go to work tomorrow. I'm going to come over and sit in the backyard and we're just going to talk for a little while. Most men, no matter how many corporations they run, no matter how many millions they have, no matter how successful they are, most men do not have that in their lives. So if you're here this morning as a man that doesn't have that in your life, I'm glad you're here. If you're a guy thinking, I'm lucky, I got one or two like that in my life, it's your chance to be that for somebody else. So hang tight, I'm going to give you some stuff. Deep friendships in the Bible. You cannot read your Bible without running into earthly angels that help the men and women that you look up to in Scripture. There are a handful of, of unique examples. But usually, if you show me a great woman or great man from God in the Bible, I'm going to show you his earthly angel. Abraham had Lot for to do that. Moses had Aaron to do that. Elijah had Elisha to do that. David had Jonathan. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament had it in spades. He had Timothy, he had Titus, he had uh, Philemon, he had Barnabas, he had Onesimus. Paul had it going. My favorite joke about Jesus is the greatest miracle of the life of Jesus is not that he walked on water and healed the lepers. The greatest miracle of Jesus is he had 12 close male friends. Pretty good joke, pretty true. He cultivated it as an example for us and he's talking to them the night before the crucifixion in John chapter 15 telling them how to survive when the bottom drops out of your world. Heavenly angels, we'll save for another time. Earthly angels, we're going to do a deep dive on. We've got to start with our definition. What is the definition of an earthly angel? Here's what I'm going to teach you in John chapter 15. An earthly angel shows up continually in response to a crisis in the life of a friend. To offer a listening ear, a warm smile, a soft touch, a word of encouragement as led by the Lord to minister a hurting soul. I'm here to confess I lived my life for decades without an earthly angel in my life. I had to learn to invest in some men over time to, so that they would be there when the bottom fell out of my world maybe someday. And then pray to God to send an earthly angel maybe to fill in the gap that some of my buddies couldn't fill in. And through the miracle of God, I got that. As I pray on a daily basis now, God, let me be an earthly angel for a broken man. I am shocked when I'll meet a buddy for breakfast, I'll meet a buddy for lunch, I'll talk to him on an air, in an airport, I'll run into him at the office, I'll run into him downtown as I go to work each day, I'll run into him at the courthouse. And a guy tells me the bottom has just dropped out of their world. They just came back from MD Anderson, and it's not good. 
their wife's gone, their kid died. Tragedy of tragedies. They lost their job. They had to file for bankruptcy. They had to do something. And God has put me in a position to be an earthly angel. So I'm speaking to you this morning not only to encourage you from John chapter 15, but to give you a little bit of my perspective on how this changed my life and saved my life. But I want you to understand some characteristics. This is what I try to embody. This is what I want you to try to embody as we study John chapter 15. Starting with an earthly angel, they've got to be a believer. Yes, non-believers can minister to you. Yes, you can minister to non-believers. The model of John chapter 15 is how we as believers survive a life that you don't think you can survive. It requires believers helping believers. Point number two, always willing to give time. You're going to see one of the characteristics. It's got to be sacrificial. One of the greatest sacrifices we can make is time. The greatest problem I experience with men in my life is they are awesome at the funeral. They are awesome when tragedy strikes. But then the hours turn into days, the days turn into weeks, and life takes over, and my buddies go back to their work, they go back to their families, they go back to their hobbies. And if they see me six or 12 months later, they'll say, hey, Chris, how's that situation going on? How are you doing since fill in the blank? That's not an earthly angel. My earthly angel is going to be willing to give me time and check in on me, if necessary, on a daily basis. My earthly angel is also going to be willing to give a listening ear. I'm not going to try to solve the problem. They're not going to preach theology. I'm not going into an earth, earthly angel situation trying to solve a problem or preach theology. I'm simply there to be a messenger from God. His eyes, his ears, his feet, his hands to give a hug. I'm not trying to solve a problem. I'm just giving a listening ear. Occasionally giving discernment. Once again, not preaching, but if they hear something crazy saying, that's not how I see you. That's not how God sees you. That's not how Scripture tells us we're supposed to act in this situation. That's discernment, not preaching, just saying, that's not what I get when I read Psalms. That's not what I get when I read Philippians. It's given us some discernment as God speaks into your heart. You're in a position to share it just a little bit. And always sacrificially loving and caring. Giving of yourself to love, giving of yourself to care. Agape love, sacrificial, unconditional. Now, with that background, let's jump into John chapter 15. We're just going to cover about six verses. It's a short study, but it's an awesome study. And I'm going to give you four characteristics you can write down. If you want to say, if you say, I want to be an earthly angel to another broken man or woman, you've got to have all four. If you're looking for somebody to be your earthly angel in advance for Christ's coming, you've got to have all four characteristics. Number one, they have to embrace personal sacrifice. Jesus says to these guys around this table, broken, crying, fearful, scared. Verse 12 of John 15, Jesus says, This is my command. Agape one another as I have agaped you. No one has greater love than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. Now, you read this and you and I immediately do the same thing. Our brain goes to the extremes. And you immediately say, well, if Jesus is going to lay down his life, If that's our model, you think, I can do that for my kids or my grandkids. I can take a bullet. I can rush into the burning home for my wife or my lovely child, right? You go to extremes. The problem is God rarely calls us to do that. There's a cross-reference in Romans 5, though, I got to do before I give you the life lesson. The cross-reference in Romans 5, verses 6 and 8 says, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if our standard is agape love from Romans chapter 5, what does that mean? That means to be an earthly angel for someone does not mean you like them. To agape love somebody else doesn't mean they're a Republican like you. Agape love means to love somebody means they're not in the same socioeconomic status as you, went to the same college as you, have the same type of job as you, live in the same neighborhood as you, go to the same country club as you. The model of Christ is loving those who are unlike him. The model of Christ is loving those that were different from him in every way of life. And Jesus says in John chapter 15, you agape others as I agape you. So if God is loving people who are unlovable, if God's loving people that are different than you, then that's the same model we have to take as we look at other people and say, God, 
make me an earthly angel for somebody. It's for anybody God wants you to minister to, not who you decide they look like you, sound like you, smell like you. It's got to be something totally different, or your willingness to be totally different. Let me give you a life lesson. While the ultimate sacrifice is the ultimate expression of love, more often we are called to give our time and resources in small measures, day by day, rather than with grand gestures. Men, this is our greatest challenge because we live by the clock. Our jobs have time deadlines, our offices have time deadlines, our family has calendars and time deadlines. Everything we do is on the calendar. So our greatest sacrifice is usually our time. To be an earthly angel is a man or a woman, you've got to say, I'm giving you time. Today when I know you're hurting, tomorrow when I know you're hurting, the next day when I know you're hurting, next week when I know you're still not better, and we're going to do it for as many days, months, or years as it takes for God to get me and you through this. It's a commitment of time, not just a commitment of your body. Corollary for men, because men like to fix things and solve problems. The greater sacrifice for most men is simply to give up time and just sit in the pain with a hurting brother. The reality of being a Neanderthal is men do not like to sit in pain. It just makes us uncomfortable, makes our skin crawl. If we're with a man that's just crying, most men want to run. We're just uncomfortable. And for God to put you in the place God wants you to be, it's to suffer through that uncomfortableness and say, God called me to sit with you in pain. I'm just going to sit here. If I need to hold you, I'm going to hold you. If I just have to sit here and take you to lunch every day or breakfast every day, we're going to do that until you get through the crisis. So the challenge for men is give up a little bit of time. Don't fix the problem. Don't try to solve the problem. Just sit in the pain. In time, the Holy Spirit will touch your heart. You'll know what to say. You'll know when to say it. But just sit in the pain. Even if you're on the phone with a buddy, you just say, it's Friday night, it's Saturday night, it's Sunday night, I know you're by yourself. I just want to know how you're doing. Just listen. Because the aspect of listening is telling that other person who's broken, you care enough about them to give them time when no one else in the world will do it. That frequently is the difference between life and death. Between somebody that can survive that issue, between a decent life, and the most horrific life they've ever encountered. When I say it is life-changing, I am not exaggerating. Folks, this is a big, big deal. Characteristic number two, earthly angels are dedicated to obedience. And by that I mean biblical obedience, not obedience to their calendar or some you know, self-standard of righteousness. It's the biblical obedience. Our verse is in verse 14 of John chapter 15. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, this does not require a deep dive in theology. It doesn't require you to be able to write a dissertation on Genesis chapter 1. It doesn't require you to preach a sermon on Romans chapter 8. It doesn't require you to understand all the Greek nuances of Logos in John chapter 1. It doesn't require any of that. What did God teach these guys in the room with Jesus for the last three years? Kindergarten 101. Pray. They knew that. They saw Jesus do it. Spend time in the Word. They knew their Hebrew Scriptures. Cling to Jesus. They knew the basics. And when Jesus says, you're my friends if you do what I command you, it's not the nuances of the Great Commission or the nuances of the Ten Commandments or something else. It's the basics. Jesus is saying, if you're going to be my friend, just do the basics. Pray, Scripture, stay close, abide. Do the basics. So he's saying, when you're helping somebody else who's hurting, lead them in the basics. Follow Jesus' command. They may not be able to pray with you, but you can pray out loud for them and let them hear what you're praying about. If you're hurting, you can just say 911 call, help me. You can listen if someone else prays for you. You don't have to do a dissertation on Matthew chapter 24 or Isaiah chapter 53. You just have to say, hey, I read something in my quiet time last night out of Psalm 87. Let me read you what God showed me this morning. Psalm 87 verse 1. Isn't this neat? Here's what God showed me this morning in this little verse. I hope that's encouraging to you. You don't have to have a seminary degree, a college degree, even a high school diploma just to say to somebody, here's one verse that meant something to me this week. That is obedience. That's what God commanded all of us to do. Life lesson. Earthly angels model and encourage biblical obedience with love and grace. 
Now this seems easy to understand, hard to do, because remember the challenge. Our sin nature is jump in bed, pull the covers over our head, and the person who's sick or hurting just says, leave me alone. The earthly angel says, basics of obedience. We got to pray. If you can't pray, I'll pray for you out loud. We got to read some Bible. You may not understand it, we might want to talk about it, but I'm going to read you one verse, and we're just going to be quiet and think about that one verse. You got to say, let's stick close to Jesus. Let's abide in him. Let's think about what Jesus would do if he were here listening. What would he say? And just kind of be in the moment, sit in the pain. That's what it means to have obedience with love and grace. Characteristic number three earthly angels are dedicated to deep sharing and mutual confidentiality. You can't be an earthly angel if you're going to go tell other people everything you've learned. The purpose of being an earthly angel is not to mobilize support from everybody you know and say, hey, such and such is really struggling. Let's rally the troops and you go take them to lunch tomorrow so I don't have to. That is not what we're talking about. Remember point number one, sacrifice is your time, your day, you're sitting in the pain. It's not rally the troops and share the pain with everybody you know in your network. It's deep sharing, mutual confidentiality. Jesus says in verse 15, I do not call you to be slaves anymore because a slave doesn't know what his master is doing. I've called you friends because I've made known to you everything I've heard from the Father. Now, Jesus didn't really use the word slave. He used the Greek word or the Hebrew word if he's speaking uh, Hebrew Aramaic, for bondservant. That's how it reads in the Greek New Testament. Can be a slave, but it's a bondservant. Bondservant culturally means different things for us because we don't have bondservants today. My associates at the law firm think they're bondservants, but they're really not. We don't understand what that means. What it means in our analogy is more like student. Someone who gives up among themselves. They give up a job, they give up some money, to learn, to be changed, to be guided, to be mentored. So if you substitute the word student and teacher, this makes a lot more sense. Jesus said, I don't call you to be students anymore because a student doesn't know what his master's doing, his teacher's doing. He says, I've called you friends because I've made you intimate. Doesn't mean physically intimate. They were close. They spent the night right next to each other in sleeping bags. He's saying, I made you intimate because I shared with you everything in my life who I am, all my secrets, all my fears, all my struggles. You heard my prayers to God the Father. Jesus is saying, I made you intimate. I called you friends because I made you intimate. And there's a great little life lesson there. Intimacy, intimacy affords little room, or I should say no room for secrets. Sharing every detail of life, regardless of how embarrassing, shameful, or scandalous, provides tremendous opportunities for healing, recovery, and growth. The greatest challenge you and I face in being an earthly angel for somebody else is your pride. Because to be an effective earthly angel, you've got to tell someone hurting how shameful you've been, how scared you've been, how depressed you have been, how fearful you're not going to live tomorrow as you felt in the past. Because see, when you confess with a dear, dear friend who's hurting, your failures, your losses, your own depression, your own anxiety, your own fearfulness, your own whatever it may be, what you've done is you've built a bridge to despair. Because their despair and their sin nature, what feeling like they're under the covers with the head pulled over, with the covers pulled over them, is that they're the only person in the world that's ever felt like this. Sin nature makes the other person feel like no one else ever gone through this tragedy. No one else knows how deep I hurt because they left. Because they hurt me deeply. Because they fired me. Because I'm facing insurmountable debt. Because I lost my job. Because there's no money in the bank. Because fill in the blank, whatever it is, they feel like there's nobody else that can relate to them. And when you give up pride and say, let me share for you my shame. Let me share with you my depression. You build a bridge to their despair and then they can walk across the bridge you built. When they walk across the bridge you built, it only becomes possible because you've shared with them your brokenness, your fear, your depression, your anxiety, and you just created intimacy. Intimacy is no secrets. Let me tell you my shameful past and you share it. Then in their brokenness, they share with you and you now have an emotional intimacy that's unlike any other relationship in your life. 
Yes, you can do that with a spouse, but with some people, that intimacy of a spouse creates almost a distance or a, a, an incompatibility for this type of situation. In my experience, that's a really critical relationship, but your earthly angels that are going to change your life the most are not going to be your spouse. Spouse can play this role, but it's usually someone else who's close to you. Characteristic number four, and then we'll start to wind it down. Earthly angels share a healthy desire for someone else's success. Or I could say a healthy desire for someone else's health and well-being. Success, health, well-being, all doing the same thing. Our verse here comes from verse 16. Jesus says, you did not choose me. I chose you. I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit and then your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Don't misunderstand this verse. This is not talking about name it and claim it. This is not talking about you pray for a new Porsche, you're getting a new Porsche next week. That is not what this verse says. It's saying God chose us to be his friends. And when God chose us, he modeled a behavior for health and ministry because Jesus has... I've made you my friends so that you could produce fruit. Fruit is not vocational success. Fruit is not money in your bank account. Fruit is not credit cards with a zero dollar balance. Fruit is when God plants something in your life and that thing comes to fruition. So the prayer for fruit is God you've gifted me. In music, for example, God, you've gifted me in ministry. God, you've gifted me in hosting socially. God, you've gifted me in whatever it is, art, relationships, service, whatever it is for you. When God gifts you in a way, the prayer that God always answers is God, use that fruit for your honor and glory. That prayer is answered every single time. You may have a different idea, different plan, different goal, different things you're trying to move towards. If you give that prayer to God, Scripture says over and over and over, He's guaranteed to answer that prayer because that fruit will be a blessing for Him and His honor and His glory. So what do we do with this? Life lesson. God called you to be a friend to some, close friend to some, and an earthly angel to a few in order to be His ears, eyes, hands and feet to those he calls you to minister to in their time of need. In my life, this transition came out of despair. Because 15 years ago, I had a situation where I looked around my life when it turned upside down, and I had a gazillion acquaintances. I had hundreds of friends. I had dozens of close friends. But when the bottom fell out of my world, I had nobody, I mean no one, including my own law firm, which has almost 170 employees, inviting me to breakfast. I was eating every single meal by myself. I was spending every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday by myself. And I said, God, this is a hell on earth. And I realized it was a hell on earth of my own creation. So I transitioned to that moment and I said and I instantly realized I've been a failure being a friend to other men who are broken. I got to do a better job. So at that moment, 15 years ago, I sat down under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and I wrote letters of apology to 100 men. I said, when your wife left you, I gave you a hug at church and I never followed up and invited you to a meal. When you were on the front page of the Houston Chronicle due to your shame, I told you I would pray for you, but I never called you at night and said, how are you doing? Please forgive me. I said, when your child died, I hugged you at the funeral, and I never followed up to see how you were doing. Please, please forgive me. Out of my brokenness, I said, I'm going to be a better, committed, agape friend and I started laying down foundations with a handful of brothers that had been there for years in my life. And I said, while we're both healthy, I'm going to invest in your life. We're going to do meals together. We're going to do a trip together if we have the ability. We're going to talk together by phone. We're going to text a couple of times a week. We're just going to stay close. And for the next 15 years, I invested in those men like I've never invested in buddies. We've been friends since we were young, but I recommitted that friendship. 
Fast forward 15 years, the bottom drops out of my world again. Guess who was there? Guess what was different than 15 years ago? Those brothers that I invested time in while things were great, as soon as the bottom dropped out of my world, I had somebody calling me every day. I had somebody taking me to breakfast, somebody taking me to lunch, somebody making sure I'm connected to the right counselor so I can talk to somebody about the crisis in my life. It just gave me a health and a support I didn't have. And then the transition is I said, just like those guys ministered to me, I said, God, you've now given me the ability to build a bridge to despair with other hurting men. And so right now I wake up every single morning and I pray, God, let me be an earthly angel. And God puts new people in your life to be an earthly angel to you besides some of those buddies that have helped you. God's put an earthly angel in my life that gave me the title of this message. God put an earthly angel in my life just to say, hey, are you okay? Let's talk. Hey, are you okay? Let's have a meal. And it's given me ability, even though I may have an acquaintance, I may have a friend, I may have a close friend, but I'm going to reach out to them, and if I'm aware they're in crisis mode, I'm going to be an earthly angel to them because that's the command from John 15 of what it takes for me to survive. Let me give you some closing points and application. We'll start with a simple point. Is Jesus truly your friend? To be a friend of the type we're talking about to other people, Jesus first has to be a friend to you. Now understand what I'm talking about. I am assume everybody here loves the Lord, knows the Lord, knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not what I'm talking about. Think about your own personal definition of a friend. Think about your own personal definition of a good friend. What does a good friend do? Talks to you, reaches out and checks on you, wants to know you better, wants to know what's going on in your thoughts and your minds. Diagnostic, do you treat Jesus Christ the exact same way? Sadly, most of us don't. He's up in heaven. He's distant. He can't go to Red Lobster with me and have lunch today. He can't, you know, answer my text message. He can, we just don't see it the way he sees it and the way he does it. But most of us don't treat Jesus the way we would an intimate, close friend. If he's truly your friend, you are then for the first time capable of being an earthly angel to somebody else because you know what it means to have Jesus as your close, intimate, personal friend. Point number two. When you become aware of a deeply hurting friend, are you willing to invest the time and energy to be an earthly angel to them? i got to say as a word of warning up front, do not take this challenge and reach out to somebody next week and say, let's have breakfast, let's have lunch, and then forget about them for six months. You just caused more damage than you tried to fix. When you make this commitment, it's a commitment, I'm with you until you are better and God tells us we're going to go help other people. So if you make this commitment to somebody and you say the prayer, God, make me an earthly angel to somebody, you're signing up for a divine commission that you do not have the right to abandon. You stay with that to the best of your ability, even if it means calling them every day, texting them every day. If you have to have lunch with them every day, you got to stay there. You'll know when they're healthy or you'll know when it's okay to let them drift off a little bit, check in on them again regularly. It may be a week, it may be a month, it may be three months. Don't let them totally go, but it doesn't have to be every day. But once you start, do not make it a one and done. If it's a one and done, you're causing a lot of damage. Third point, when the bottom drops out of your world, do you have one or more extremely close friends whom you can rely on as your earthly angel? If you're a woman here, the odds are you've probably got somebody like that in your life. You may have two or three. If you're a man and you think you've got somebody who can be an earthly angel, odds are you are delusional. Because odds are it's somebody you talk about the Astros with, you talk about the kids, you talk about your job, but they are not there for you. If they text you, it's not to check and say, how are you doing? And they want to know the answer. If they see in the hallway or walking down the hallway and they say, how are you doing? They really don't want to know the answer. You've got to invest in men, men, to have them invest in you and the bottom drops out of your world. I'll make you one guarantee and we'll end on this. The guarantee is the next days, weeks, or months, the bottom is going to drop out of your world. It'll be a death you don't expect. It'll be a diagnosis you don't expect. It'll be a fractured relationship you don't expect. It'll be something you do not want vocationally or financially. And if you don't make the time to invest today, you're going to be in a heap of trouble when that time comes. So use the motivation of this lesson in John 15 to change the way you lay the foundation today for the earthly angel you're going to need in the days, weeks, and months to come. And the second challenge is, just like that crisis is coming for you, that crisis has already hit someone this weekend. 
that crisis is going to hit somebody you know this week. The sensitivity in your prayer is, God, let me be in the right position at the right time to know when the bottom drops out of their world, I'm going to be there and I'm going to be their earthly angel. Can you do that this week? Can you make that prayer? You better say yes or i got to back up and teach you John 15 all over again. You're going to be late for lunch. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the challenge in John 15 to be an earthly angel. We pray, God, that you'd give us opportunities this week to be the earthly angel for someone else. For the opportunity you may have already given us, we ask for forgiveness for not doing it right. For those that have poured themselves into our lives, even in times of pain, we thank you, God, for those angels you've sent to our lives, and we thank you for the fact they've kept us alive. You know who they are. We know who they are. We thank you for the earthly angels that have saved our lives. Our prayer this morning is that you put us in a position to be the same type of earthly angel to someone who needs it the most. We ask these things not by our will, not by our might, not by our strength, but through the might and strength and will of Jesus Christ who indwells our hearts the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. It's our